Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the power of your spirit here, for the love we feel. Lord, that you have given us a home away from home because when we come here, Lord, we know that we are part of the family because families are not... uh, They don't have limitations by borders and cities because it's a hard condition. And I thank you for the family of God, for the love and and the generosity and just the purity we feel in this church and in this nation and that you have allowed us to make a part and be a part. And Lord, I just ask you to help me to just expound your word because, oh Lord, it's not by might and power, it's by your spirit. And I pray that you you awaken us and strengthen us and encourage us to run the race, oh Lord, because we know there is a price to win. And I just thank you for the anointing which breaks every yoke. I thank you for the leadership in the church, for the elders, for everyone who has a part of it and it catches the vision for this time and for this season and for this hour. And I just ask you, God, that your anointing will just come with the unction of your spirit to do what you need to do by your spirit in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Are you going to put it on? Huh? Well, when do I quit? Okay, good. I want to read a scripture out of Isaiah chapter 55. Actually, this is just dropped in my heart about two nights ago. And I think it's really something which the Lord does does in our life to make us realize how important it is to have the right memory. Now, Isaiah chapter 55, I'm just reading 6 6 to 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion passion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways declares the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts you know as I was lying in bed on a a few nights ago suddenly I got that illumination and I realized as we strive forwards all of us we're striving forwards to reach goals and destiny and God has put it within us to give us faith to believe the impossible I thought you know life is not always something where we accomplish great things when you look at really the earth and you look at what God does my whole life has really to to do with returns Uh, it's not just to move ahead but that actually what even in nature you can see it when you see the birds and, and you see the animals what is done within them there's always something within them where they have a desire to return like migrating or they come to a place where they birth the place they were born how animals go to, like salmon go to a travel against the flow and against circumstances to bring to birth where they were born and I thought you know my whole life really has to do with return now when you think what return really means return means revival and being refreshed and being stimulated in that what God has in your life now there is nothing nothing for everlasting I think the whole thing when you look at Abraham and I'm going to go there or even Cain and Abel how did the desire come to even bring sacrifices to bring offering there was no teacher there was no revelation of it there was nothing which the people could learn at those days and time and yet within Cain and Abel there was a desire to return to return to the place they have lost to return to the place for their mother and father was creation created and fashioned in the power and anointing of the spirit and when you see throughout your life 
It doesn't matter. Your home you built, your environment you built, you would have no power if you could not return. With other words, your home is not something for you leave. Your home is something for you return to, to establish something which God wants to do in your life. And in all of our life, I can, I'm going to show you in the scripture, this when we don't return to the place, and this is what the Lord is speaking here. He prevented Israel to return to Egypt. And you can see sin is something where we return, where we destroy what God wants to do in your life. Now, the whole baptism as you see it and the experiences in your life, when God comes and he infuses you with power and infuses you and he gives you new thoughts and new illumination and a new life. It's there for you so that you have a new point of return. A new point to get to, to get back to. And if you don't have a new point to get back to, we wander us. And we are, we are not even pilgrims. We are fugitives. And you know so many times in your life and in my life, when we don't establish now the only thing which is abiding within you, it's the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus left us and he said he must return. And that's why he, the Holy Spirit came and he, the Holy Spirit makes me realize doesn't matter how far I go, it's the only thing within me, the Spirit of God, which abides. Everything else is growing because you lose and you return. You lose and you return. Now no, the Lord speaks here in Isaiah, in, in Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek him while he may be found. Call up on him while he be near. Now there is a time in your life and in mine when the Lord revealed something to you. Now how do you know what to seek? How do you know where to go and what to look for in your life? And I realize that when I become a seeker, a seeker, I don't become a seeker because somebody tells me there is something out there. I'm not in a gold rush. I become a seeker because something is there I need to incorporate in my life so that I can be found in the, be finding that what God has. Now, he says this, he said, the wicked forsake the way. Now, the wicked <coughs> means the ones who violate the standard and who walk in guilt. Now, I would say many, many Christians who are saved struggle with guilt. We have a guilty conscience in your life. And if you have a guilty conscience with other words, <coughs> then God makes a childlike. What is the, so important to be childlike? To be guilt-free. To not walk in a guilty conscience. And there are hundreds and hundreds of Christians who are guilty because we violate the standard which separates us from the ability to find him. Now, you don't find him in the preaching. <coughs> you can only find his presence as he him comes within you and brings the revelation in your life <coughs> so that you find something deep within in me too where I can return to. You have not found anything excuse me, <coughs> if you can't return to. Everything God does in your life <coughs> has a point for you and I to return, that won't help, to return what God wants to do in your life. Now, I realize when, uh, let me show you something in the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation, the churches of Revelation, our church is the Lord chosen in this day. And I think when you read, I used to preach a lot on the seven churches of Revelation. And you can see when you preach on the seven churches of Revelation, 
You can see it in every church because you and I are the church, it's not a congregation. And you can see the struggle of the overcoming power. <coughs> this is what the Lord says here. To the, angel, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and you cannot tolerate evil. Now imagine that. Evil men. And you put and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. What a powerful testimony. Imagine that. Powerful. And hear what the Lord said. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent to the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of this place unless you repent. Now what is repentance anyways? Repentance is not just crying and confessing. Repenting means you return. In other words, when your conscience is bothering you and, you're, when you, and you don't feel free. Now, if your conscience is bothering you and you don't feel free in your life, you can have big goals and you can have goals for your family, goals for your marriage, goals for your job and whatever. And you can move forward. But you can't really move into what God has. Because the move into what God has comes always to return. I always have to return to a place where I yield to the Lord and God can change my thoughts and God can change me and I cannot do it just walk forward. You have to return. But he said, if I don't return, my whole life has to do with returning. Now, I have been here, I think I have a record. I'm not, I'm not the biggest preacher, I'm not the greatest preacher, but I have one record in this nation. In some of these churches, I have been here since 1982. I have come every year and sometimes twice. Now, what happened because I returned? When sometimes I said, God, I, I, you know, sometimes I look at my ministry, I think there's nothing. We walk through our life. And what do you have to show? I have nothing to show. I have no building. I have not built orphanages. I have not built soup kitchens. I have not built Bible schools. I have not written great books. I have nothing. So when I look at this and I look at my life, and for 52 years, what had the Lord done in my life? Not because I pressed forward, but I was able to return. I was able to return to a place which God has because you cannot bring sacrifices without returning. You have to return to a place because if you don't return and God cannot deal with your awareness and your consciousness in your life, what he said to the church of Ephesus, if you don't return to your first love, why? Why did they have to return? Because they reached the place all the other things could not do they reached the place even so they have persevered and even so they have fed and even so they went against false apostles and lived for the truth they have been a place in their life where they reached the depths of love and brokenness where they have to return to to come to the place and you see, in all of our life, as you love the Lord, there has to be a place broken open where you return to because otherwise your temptation will be always returned back to Egypt. Now, let me give you an example in Abraham's life. In, in Genesis 12, verse 7, 
Abraham was coming out of Ur Chaldea. Now God called Abraham to become a man and he took a hidden man to make him a man of faith and power and revelation. Now you can see, let me just read it to you, Genesis 12 verse 7. So the Lord appeared to Abraham, not to Abraham, to Abraham and said to your descendant, I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, for he had to appear to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Now listen. So Abraham in Genesis 13. So Abraham went, oh no, it's in 12. In verse 10, the same chapter. Now there was a famine. In the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt and he traveled there for the famine was very severe. Now you can see every time Israel goes to Egypt, there's a type of flesh. It's when the famine comes. The famine has a power in your life. Now there is always a famine in our life. You can, it's a famine of the word and famine of revelation and famines. There are famines. You don't always walk in abundance. And what does a famine do? You deal with what? With an instinct of self-preservation. This is what Abraham did. He said what to his wife? I'm not going to die for you. Please protect me. You're beautiful. I'm just going to let you be there and help me and help Pharaoh. Now, what does the famine do? He was a man of faith called. It brings on the instinct of self-preservation. Now, every famine does that. In all of your life, there's a famine in your life. In my life, we have gone to famine where we deal and we confronted with Satan and he confronts us because our flesh wants to live. Now, what does a famine do? A famine brings a desire of return. Return. A famine, when you famine, you feel a famine inside. Maybe a famine of love. Where do, you don't want to go forward. You want to return to the point where you remember the tough warmth of your heart, the heat of your life, the experience, the fellowship of Christ. Me, you. And you see, when the Lord told, tells us the whole offering scene, to, for me to bring a sacrifice is for what? To return to my first love. That's why you give money to experience something. You cannot go forward unless you go forward. You give back. And I think in all our life on this earth, we always have to return. It's only Christ. Even Christ has to return to get his bride. There's the only one who does not de return. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit abides within him. He has no returning power. He is there. He abides. And he gives me confidence. So I can move in that. What the Lord has. Now what did Abraham have to do? After he went to Egypt. Now what does a famine do? Any kind of famine creates a cry. Sometimes we need to go to famines so that there is a cry born within us, a cry more than for prosperity, a cry for the touch of God, a cry for the breath of God, a cry for the power of God, so that you and I can what? To return to what? To the return of our first altar, to the return of the first perfume, the first fragrance, in our life. So he can, what does he do with the sacrifice? He purifies my consciousness. He fine tunes me in my life. And you see, as I look at Abraham, and I look at his life, what happened after he denied, imagine how, what effect that would have on a marriage. I don't know. He did it not only once, he did it twice, the man of faith. 
Twice he saved his life. The head of the house. No, I don't know what it did to, to Sarah. Imagine, I mean, do you know these guys are not just going to look at her? That those guys have passion and desire and they're longing for her. And where do you go forward in times like that? And you know, here you see Abraham. He comes out of Egypt just like the children of Israel. Less like us. And what does he have to do? You don't go forward. You have to come back. You have to come back to your first love. You have to come back to your commitment. You have to come back to that, what the Lord has in your life. Now, where did he come back? And Genesis chapter 18, he comes out of Egypt and he does what? He goes to the altar which he first started, the altar of his first touch of God, of his first anointing, of his first power. Why? Because if he would not done that and he would not gone back and he would not experience, come on back. That's what he said here in Isaiah. Come back to your first love. Come back so I can change your thoughts and change your life and wash you. Now, what did Abraham have to do? If you never return to the place of your first love, to the place of your first commitment, you cannot make right decisions. Because decisions we have to make cannot come from reasoning as a church of Christ, the church of the Lord. The decisions we have to make is because God moves up on us. And today the churches in the world has to make decisions totally different, born by the Spirit, moved by the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit. Now what happens? He comes back and he went, here that's what it says, he went on his journey as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been on the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and that Abraham called on the name of the Lord. After what? After he returned. Now my whole life is a return. You cannot build relationships without returning. You cannot build marriages without returning. You cannot build generations without returning. You must return to the place where you've had the deepest experience with God in your life. Otherwise, you can't go on. You can't go on from level to level if you don't return. Me either. Now, what is the key What Abraham had to too. He had to make decisions. His nephew went with him. It's a whole family affair. Here he is and he moves into the purpose. Now there's many people who have not inspired. They move. It's just like the mixed people who moved with Israel into the promised land. Now here nephew, now you know Lot means the veil. Veil. Now Lot, you can walk with God's anointed and still have a veil of carnality. In other words, we have the carnality, my senses and my who I am, my flesh. It's a veil. It has to be rent. Now, the veil of carnality, if it's in my life, you cannot enter the holies of holies and the purpose of what God wants to do. He comes out in the secret places of the Most High God. Now, what did he have to do? He, they cannot walk longer together. Why? Because Lot has a problem. Lot has never built an altar, and Lot had never called on the name of the Lord. He just walked with Abraham. Now, when you go on the fast, it's good to do that. Because in a time like that, you cannot depend on anybody else. You have to depend on your drafts, on your cries, on your desires, on your stripping in your life. And all of us. And you see, once Lot comes, it comes to a point as he never called on God and as he never built an altar, he was watched the altar. He lived at the sacrifices of Abraham. He walked in the power of Abraham. And some of us, we can be in church 
and never be the church. And you see, too, for me to become the church, I have to have a point of return. If you have no point of return and all you see is your struggles and your carnality and your flesh, you are unable to move in what God has. I'm not saying you're not safe. Do you understand that? I'm not talking about safe. You're safe by the blood of Jesus. You can be as carnal as you want all your life long. If you believe the blood of Jesus, you will be safe. You will be in heaven. But you miss life. And you know what it is? Jesus Christ died for me to have abundant life and we exist. We exist religious life in our life. Now, here I, I just going to show you how it affected Abraham because he did what? He returned. Now, it says, Lot, in verse 9 and chapter 13, or verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of Jordan. That is well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt to go to Zohar. So Lot shows for himself all the valley of Jordan. And Lot journeyed eastward and separated himself from each other. Now what happened? Lot looked. Lot choose and Lot walk into what judgment? Sodom and Gomorrah was already judged, but he had no discernment. He had no point of return. He went forward right into the land of destruction. Now, what did Abraham do? For the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look for the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendant forever. Now what did Lot Abraham do? He didn't choose. He let Lot choose. And God did the choosing for him. Now you must understand to give up your choice is something very powerful. To, for you to not to choose when you have the ability to choose and the power to choose and the authority to choose and you step back and let other men choose the best part, you have to have what? A point of return. And you can see as Lot had a, a moved into Sodom and Gomorrah. I looked at Abraham and I think, God, how could he make such wise decisions in his life? Even so, he had his trials and his circumstances and whatever he is. And I realized the reason he could make the right decision because he always had the point of return. He had a return to know where to go, to know how to come back, to know how to enter. And you see, all of us, it's not just to reach goals. Your whole life is a return. What happened after I sinned Adam and Eve? This returns to dust. It's a whole cycle in your life. Your whole cycle, even in your human nature, we can see we return, what? We start off toddlers and then the end, what happens? We, when we're old, we see our limitations of our life. And if I have no point to return to, of commitment and fire, and anointing in your life, all the things you reached and all the things you've done in community, all the titles you have, all the money you have, all these things you have in your life. Now, you know, I look at my brother. I never knew his wealth. He used to say to me when he was struggling and, and, and when he was coming, I mean, he, I was first time I ever came to America, uh, to Canada. I was 15 years old and I couldn't even speak one word English. And I would come to my brother, pete my way, and I paid it off because I babysitted this child who is now 50, 60 years old. And you see, I looked at him and I looked at his life as I watch him and 
rise in society and he laughed cars and, and, and he went, when I went to his garage and I seen all the cars which you can't even imagine when he was in the heights of even his factory sent him on a plane to Monaco to the car racing because he was so enamored with that. Now he's 84 years old. In the ten, last 10 years of his life. Now you have to remember, his greatest heart was he wanted to preach. He wanted to be a man of God. But he couldn't because in those days he got divorced. And he thought he had no place ever to have a chance to serve the Lord. And he turned away from ministry. But he stand. Righteous, you know, I, as he was 80 years old, they had a big party. And I didn't know his testimony. And these guys all came. He worked, they worked for him 30 years in his business. He had businesses all over. And you know what it touched me when these guys came and they give speeches at my brother's 80th birthday. They said, they said, our experience and our memory of how we could not wait to go to work. We could not wait to be at work because of the environment which was created for us to move and to be. And you know, the experience of them returning made the man with vision. You can never be a man and a woman of vision if you uh, hate to return to places you have created, places you have made. Play Some of us, we create places we hate ourselves. We create environments where we don't even want to return to. You run away to other wives, to other husbands, to other lovers because you create an environment you don't yourself want to return. Now to be successful in Christ, I have to return to the sacrifices. I have to return to him who died 2,000 years ago to lay his body down and to die for me so that I can what? Go on in the power, in the future of what God has in our life. Now, as I see, and that's where I start, as I see my brother, People think he's crazy, all the money he gives. He, cre he has six kids. He created a family foundation. And they have board meetings and decide what they want. Now, I, we don't believe in manipulation, not at all. You can't, I see some people think the spirits are the greatest manipulator. They manipulate God in prayer, manipulate God in all kinds of things. Now, if you go to East London, I don't put that on YouTube today. As I go to East London, uh, we have a friends, you know, Rocco and Maureen. Now, here they are. We go there 30 years to returning. We become friends. Been in church, we're friends now. Missing each other. Friends, that's friends. So here they are, have a little tiny church. Pressed in thousand people in that little tiny church. Have a little fun. They have already the plans. They sacrifice to make the plans for the church to build the church so they fit in. So when you're in that church in those days, they, they, they were sitting on the platform. They were sitting underneath you. You, you had no room. You had sardines in a can. So one day, imagine how God does and I'm spraying and thinking, wouldn't that be nice if Ryan could help Rocco and Maureen? I don't say a word. I don't even say a word to David, but in my heart. So one day, four years ago, Jennifer calls us. She's my sister-in-law. She says, guess what? Ryan wants to travel with you for eight days. It's on his bucket list. Ooh. Now we drive old cars and <laughs> no five star treatment. <laughs> so he comes. They drive with us. It was his 80th birthday, I think, around that time. 
We get the car from the sheep we rental. Our friend, he lets us rent sheep cars, but they have 350,000 kilometers on the speedometer, but they last. So we are in this car, he comes with us, and we are in this church. Now, my brother was not a very charismatic guy. He was a Baptist for many years. And he comes into this church, and I'm praying. I'm thinking, I'm going to see a miracle. I'm not saying a word. I'm going to see a miracle in my heart. I'm going to see a miracle. And they're sitting there. Maureen says, well, we're going to take our building fund offering. And the little kids come all with their little glasses. You know, they have so jars where they put their pennies in. And here they come and put all their little jars in to build the church. And my brother cries. Talk about crying. And he comes to the point of his return. That's what happened to him the last 10 years. He returned. He returned, maybe longer than that. He returned. And three years later, you should see it. I want you to come. It's one of the most beautiful churches he built. 1,200 people fit in. They had to build it around the old church because it was, uh, what do you call it, huh? Oh, it's historical side. It is the most amazing thing. I'm standing there when I go there. I say, not one manipulation. I didn't say one word. It was not me begging him. God did it. And you know, I, I, I believe when I look at him, I say to him, I, because they're asking him for money all the time, people manipulate him. I see it. He Christians manipulate, trying to manipulate him. I said, Ryan, did you get tired of it? My sister will get feisty sometimes when she feels that she's manipulated. And he says to me, see, when you much give, given, much is required of you. And I'm so proud of him. Not because of what he has done, but who he has returned to. Returned to his first love. Returned to his first place. Right now, he's building a hospital in the Congo for women who've been raped. 60 beds. He wants to go there, 84 years old. And what I'm telling you today, I don't brag, but I'm telling you today, and I'm going to make part two in the second meeting. What I'm telling you today, you cannot go forward if you don't return. You must return like the dove returned to the ark. You have to return to the place of your first love. If I don't, you know what it says when he says, I take away your lamp. That means your enlightenment and your revelation. You're inside. I'm going to take away. And imagine you're serving the Lord and you live in darkness. You're serving the Lord and you do things with your own strength, your own power, your own effort, but you don't know his fire. Listen, your whole life, look at you. You can only establish and go forward if you return. Return to me. You know what God did for trouble that Israel wouldn't return to Egypt? He meant trouble. He made detours for them. And they still they return to Egypt. The mind in thoughts. And you know your memory is so powerful. Because your memory is the returning point. Because the memory is everything you have lived. Not what you're going to live. And if God does not transform my memory. Where do you return to? Your frustration. Your anxiety. Your fights. Your substance abuse, sex, pornography. You know how much these things are dominating in church today. People who don't know how to return to his first love and power. I think my time is up. Heavenly Father, I hope this made sense. But I know this day, O oh Lord, that there is such a 
opportunity in South Africa. Such a great people. Lord, for us, this nation is the love of our life. You have birthed it in our hearts and birthed it in our life and birthed it what we have done, what you have done. And I pray, Lord, that tonight, this morning, that my brothers and sisters can return. Return after our famines, our confusions, our fears, our doubts, our anxieties, that we can turn to our first love. To return to that point where we abandoned ourselves to you, where we trusted you with all our hearts, where we believed in you with such strength and power. And I pray this morning, help us to return to our first altars, where we smelled your aroma and felt your fire. And will you reveal your life to us? Help us, O oh Lord, so we can go on from glory to glory, from power to power, to become man and woman. You can use in this generation, not to might and power, but by your spirit. Bless this church. We love it so much. In Jesus' name.